would like at this time to introduce Haley Matson Mathis, who's the executive director of the Hawaii Culinary Education Foundation, and they generously support all of our student assemblies, and they also support culinary education at the post-secondary level, as well as the high school level. So she can talk about that, as well as introduce our guest. Thank you. Aloha, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you. Our whole purpose at the Hawaii Culinary Foundation as a nonprofit is all of you, the future of culinary. You've heard me say this before, but we're counting on you someday to be the ones that go into the industry, the ones that are up here that will be presenting a program perhaps in the future. We mentor at the high schools and have worked with um, all of the high schools throughout Hawaii. We also do culinary programs at all the community colleges as well as professional chef workshops. And our goal is to elevate a culinary in Hawaii and one way we're doing that is today by bringing in someone who would spend a dream of Joan Nam Kuhn, who's in the back of the room uh, and serves on the Hawaii Culinary Foundation Board, and I, and uh, is to bring in Grace Young. And Grace is known throughout the United States for her work. She is an award-winning cookbook author. She's a culinary historian and a filmmaker. But she is also the 2022 recipient of the Julia Child Foundation Award and the James Beard Foundation Humanitarian of the Year Award. These are significant recognitions and the reason being is for her tremendous work in working with Chinatowns around the country and also she has been recognized by USA Today as one of the 2023 Women of the Year honorees to save America's Chinatowns. She was recently named, if that was not enough, to Forbes 50 over 50 list of most impactful and influential women. Wow, those are significant things to take in. And I have all of you in the, your bio that you have in your handout, and I hope you'll take time to visit her, her bio that you have in there, the link to read more about her work. She's been featured in news publications, television shows. She was recently this week here in Hawaii on Hawaii Public Radio talking about her work. And she's really been a fierce advocate for Chinatowns, never more so than in her video series, Coronavirus. Chinatown stories that she produced in collaboration with Dan On, And she will be speaking this week here in Honolulu. So you're very fortunate because you get a VIP time with her in, in this cooking demonstration on stir fries. But she'll be speaking in uh, at Honolulu Holly about her work on Chinatowns. And you're all welcome to attend that as well coming up on Thursday evening. So at this time, I'd like to have Grace come forward. And she's going to share with you. Uh, her award-winning work and her breath of the walk and also her stir-frying to the sky's edge work today. Hello, all of you. Can you hear me? Perfect. Um, so, aloha. This is my first time in Hawaii and I am loving it. I came from New York City where it's 60 degrees colder. 60. So we're going to start the presentation today with one of my videos and it's a walk comedy. It's very short and after that I'll come back. Mama always wanted me to become a doctor or a concert pianist. I never meant to be a therapist. It just sort of happened. People found out about me through my website and on social media. I've never met most of my patients. They email me photos and confess their anxieties and insecurities. That's how I became a walk therapist. Maybe it started because of my cookbooks, my walk classes, or because I'm known as the stir fry guru. Many of my patients are like new parents, anxious and intimidated. They've had their carbon steel walks for weeks or months and can't summon the courage to season it. They ask me, do I know anyone who can season it for them? They're willing to pay cash. But I tell them you really need to do it yourself. It's important walk bonding time. Chinese cooks season a walk by just stir frying scallions and ginger. 
After a lot of agonizing, the new walk parents finally take that first big step. Only now they're convinced they've done it completely wrong. They look at photos of my walk, then they look at their walk. It's never good to compare. And so it begins, the phase I call WOCD, Walk Obsessive Compulsive Disorder. Every inch of the walk is scrutinized, each flaw is magnified, and there's a preoccupation with walk perfection. They email me, help. I finally season my walk and I love cooking with it, but the spatula is scraping the patina on the walk. What should I do? Gerald. I write back, a metal spatula will scratch the patina, but those scratches tell a story and they give your walk character. As you continue to cook with your walk, those scratches will evolve and eventually dissolve into your patina. Others anxiously write, I stir fried the most delicious meal, then I wash my walk and I wiped it with a paper towel and there's a faint brown stain. Is that rust because I'm getting really nervous? Sally, when I reply, I'm aware this is full blown walk paranoia. I explain, the brown color is patina. It's perfectly normal. It never ceases to amaze me how much reassurance new walkers need. They want to know what they can do to make their walks look old overnight. I indulge them with some quick walk aging tips. You can season a walk with flaxseed oil in the oven and that will accelerate the patina. A bacon bath will make your walk glow. Or popping corn disperses oil all around the walk and intensifies the patina. Use your walk to deep fat fry and your walk will mature quickly. They all love cheating time with their walk. I confide in them every walk ages differently, like us. Don't rush the process. You reform your relationship with your walk each time you cook with it. Good things in life take time. I remind them that their walk is resilient. It will have good days and bad days. It's just like life. Stuff happens. And even if their patina gets damaged, it's easily restored. Just wash your wounded walk, and with lots of tender loving cooking, the patina will return. You'll be back in business. Walk around the clock. So I created this video um, because it's based on reality. I have been doing, I've been writing cookbooks on stir frying and wok cooking for the last 20 years. And I have been getting emails from readers. Um, sometimes people send me messages on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, because they bought their wok for the first time. And people get really nervous. I don't know how many of you have ever seasoned a new carbon steel saute pan or wok. But as you know, unlike cast iron, it doesn't just darken going from gray to black, but it goes through this weird phase where it can turn yellow, blue, black, and it looks like you've ruined your pan. So people get really nervous and intimidated. And for me, um, I have really devoted my culinary career to um, preserving the traditions of wok cooking. So, so many people think of the wok as a stir fry pan, but it's so much more. In addition to stir frying, you can pan fry, deep fat fry, steam, boil, poach, braise, smoke. Um, but today we're going to concentrate on stir frying. And my expertise really comes um, when I was a child, I got interested in cooking because of Julia Child. And I was brought up in a traditional Cantonese family where we only had Cantonese food. So when I saw Julia Child on TV, she just sort of awakened my interest in cooking. And I was fascinated by everything that wasn't Chinese. And I did this, you know, I was very lucky I got an internship program with Dole Pineapple in their test kitchen in San Francisco. Um, I was able to work with Time Life Books for about 15 or 20 years in their test kitchens, and I ran their food photography studio. But in my 30s, I began to realize that I really missed home cooking. And so I spent a lot of time and energy traveling back to San Francisco to cook with my parents. And in learning the old recipes, 
I found my voice, and my first cookbook was a memoir cookbook. And since then, my expertise, as I said, is in wok cooking. The New York Times calls me the stir-fry guru. So I know a lot of you have taken, um, uh, have, have had experience stir-frying here at the school using a professional wok stove. Some of you haven't. My expertise is in stir-frying for the home cook. And so I've really analyzed what makes and what, what are the secrets and tips for stir-frying at home. Um, today, we're going to do two stir-fries for you. The first one is a classic salt and pepper shrimp. And I think all of you have the recipes. Now, this is a recipe that is typically served in a restaurant. And in the restaurants, uh, uh, cooks typically will oil blanch the shrimp first before they stir fry it in the salt and pepper mixture. So when you stir fry, one of the reasons why I think it's such a fantastic cooking technique to teach, and especially in this time of our lives, first of all, it is so delicious, it is so fast, um, but it also, there's a phrase I use, it makes more out of less. That you can take very, very simple ingredients and make an incredible stir fry. So the home version of the classic pepper and salt shrimp doesn't call for the oil blanching. So it's much less oil and the flavor is so incredible. So it's healthy for you, it uses very little fat, and when you talk about stir frying, there are so many recipes that you can see these days online, in cookbooks, newspapers, magazines, and so many of them are bad. The problem is that um, oftentimes they call for nonstick cookware, they call for um, too much food. So the results, too, much, too many ingredients in the wok, so it takes down the temperature of the wok, and so the results are, are very, very mediocre. So today we're going to do this pepper and salt shrimp, and um, let me just go over the basics with you right now. And I have my, my stir fry assistants right here. So um, we are going to, they're going to, we're going to do what I call simo stir frying, and we'll stir fry together. Um, this calls for one pound of shrimp, and we don't have a sink very close by, but normally I would add, this is one pound of shrimp, I would add about a tablespoon of salt, and then I stir it together. And through the magic of Leland Community College, <laughs> um, AJ is now going to rinse the shrimp in cold water to remove the salt. Ta-da. Oh, I'm sorry. Roland, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Um, and then we're going to do a second time. And the reason why we brine the shrimp is to give it a crisper texture. Without using the brine, the texture of the shrimp can often be a little bit mushy. So I'm going to go through the rest of the ingredients with you. We are going to take, this is a half a teaspoon of salt and a quarter teaspoon of sugar, and we're going to combine them. This is Sichuan peppercorns. I don't know if how many of you are familiar with this ingredient, but it's really not a peppercorn, it's a berry. And so yesterday, we took the Sichuan peppercorns, removed all the twigs and stems, and then we put them in a cold, normally you use a cold wok, and stir fry it on low, medium low heat for two or three minutes, just until they're fragrant and before the Sichuan peppercorns really begin to smoke. And once they're fragrant, you take them off the heat. Thank you. So now I add the rest of the salt. I just want you to see this process and then it gets rinsed again. Um, the Sichuan peppercorns are roasted and then we use a mortar and pestle to grind it. And 
you need, you need to start with a very small amount because we're only using a quarter of a teaspoon of the Sichuan peppercorns. The rest of the ingredients are very simple. We have two one tablespoon portions of the oil. When you're stir frying, you're always using an oil with a high smoking point. Typically in Chinese cooking, it would be peanut oil, but when I do a cooking demo, I never use peanut oil because I'm afraid there could be someone out there with a peanut allergy. So you could use grapeseed, you could use avocado, rice bran oil, even safflower. And then here we have one tablespoon tablespoon of minced ginger. We're going to add one tablespoon of minced garlic and one teaspoon of minced jalapeno chilies and they have this they still have the seeds in them. And that's it. So those are all of your ingredients for this recipe. This is a dry stir fry. So often when people talk about stir fries, they just say it's a stir fry. But there are dry stir fries, moist stir fries, simple stir fries. Um, a dry stir fry is distinguished by the fact that there is absolutely no liquid that will be added to the stir fry. And what that does is it intensifies the flavor and um, it just, thank you so much. And that's been, so this has been patted dry. This is a very, very important step because if you just rinse the shrimp, put it in the colander and shook it dry, um, it's not, it's still wet to the touch. And so when you, we should put the woks on the burners. When you um, heat up your wok and add the shrimp to the hot wok, it's bound to take down the temperature. So it's always important when you're stir frying shrimp and especially vegetables to make sure they are absolutely dry to the touch. So we are going to fire up the woks right now. And where is our, does everyone have a cup of water? Yeah, okay. So we're heating these woks on the highest heat. I was on the Today Show last summer, and you have to get there really early in the morning, like seven o'clock, but I couldn't sleep the night before because I was worried about what kind of stove they were gonna give me, and I could not go in early. They wouldn't let me go in a week or two weeks early to test the stove um, for its power. And there's nothing more nerve-wracking than being on live television, and if the wok stove isn't hot enough, your stir fry, nothing's gonna happen. Or if it's too hot, you don't wanna set the smoke alarms off at the Today Show. They will never invite you back. So my wok is just starting to smoke now. I'm gonna flick a drop of water into this wok and it should evaporate immediately. So normally, I, I'm not sure how powerful this stove is. It's the first time I'm using it. So we're gonna swirl in one tablespoon of oil. There must be a little bit of water still in there. And now we're gonna add the ginger and garlic mixture and just stir fry it just until it's fragrant. I call this simul stir frying. And now we're gonna immediately add all of the shrimp. So because this is not a restaurant situation, I'm not sure how powerful these burners are, but I'm guessing it's probably about 12,000 BTUs, which is not super, super powerful. So I'm simulating what like a home cook would be dealing with. If you were stir frying in China on a typical restaurant stove or even a home cook, home stove, um, they're set much hotter than an American residential range. But because generally most residential ranges in America are not that powerful, we let it spread out to give it a chance to start to stir, to start to brown. And now we can stir fry the mixture and add the last tablespoon of oil. So yesterday when we saw these woks, I just tried them out on the burner just to see what the heat was like, and they were immediately smoking. There was a lot of residual oil on the woks, 
So we clean the wok with salt. So at this point, we're stir frying for another minute or two, just until it's cooked through. And now we're adding the salt, sugar, and Sichuan peppercorns. And make sure you sprinkle it all around so it's not in just one spot. And that's it. So you guys are serving? Are you? Okay. I told her to bring me a half of All right. You need to get rid of So can I put it here? Yeah. Okay. Is that happening soon? Yeah. Okay. I saw you were finishing up. Okay, sorry. I'll be back in a second. Okay. Um, so everyone in China stir fries, but the Cantonese are considered the great masters. And the Cantonese have this term when a stir fry has been made perfectly. It possesses wok hei. So hei in Cantonese is the same as qi in Mandarin. So it means breath, life force. And I translate it as the breath of a wok. So when I was growing up, whenever we went to a restaurant, my father always wanted to sit at the table closest to the kitchen door, which in America is when the maitre d' doesn't respect you and he throws you back there. But for my father, he wanted the least amount of time to elapse from the food coming out of the wok onto the plate and into our mouths so that you could, pos so you could experience wok hay. And I always explain to people that wok hay is like food that comes right off the grill. When you have grilled a piece of chicken or steak, when you eat it right off the grill, there's an extra seared essence and a kind of smoky aroma and flavor that only lasts for a few minutes. 10 minutes later, five minutes later, the food is still delicious, but it's lost that essence. And so I don't know if you could sense it, but I was freaking out a little bit now when I just took it off the heat and realized the food wasn't ready to be served right away because I want you to experience that wok hay. So when you get your sample of shrimp, you should eat it right away. Don't wait for everyone else to be served so that hopefully you can experience that wok hay. But all of this time now, we're losing wok hay. <laughs> Um, my father, the last thing he would ever want in the world is to be seated across the room from the kitchen because the concept of the platter walking through the whole room and completely cooling down means that you will lose the, the wok hay. So um, I hope it comes out to you very, very soon. Um, we should switch now to the chicken. and keep the water. Yep. Thank you. Um, actually, it's right here, and I'm gonna turn it the other way. Yeah. Thank you. Now the recipes that I chose for today's demo, I chose because the Lunar New Year is coming up on February the 10th. And it's going to be the year of the dragon. And the Chinese believe that when a new year begins, it's a time for a fresh start and new beginnings. And it's very important, starting with New Year's Eve, to eat foods that have special meaning. If you eat particular foods during the two-week period, you can change your, your fortune for the coming year. And so people love to eat shrimp because the word for shrimp in Chinese is ha, and so it, it signifies laughter and joy in the coming year. I'm demo demonstrating for you a longevity 
um, chicken, a longevity noodle and chicken recipe with mushrooms and ginger. The meaning of this is chicken signif signifies a proper beginning and end to the year. We have noodles, which signify longevity, and scallions, which in Chinese, the word for scallions is tung, and the word for intelligence is tung ming. So if you eat a dish that, uh, that um, includes scallions, you're said to be, you'll be brilliant in the coming year. So we want to give you um, the experience and um, good fortune of eating Lucky Foods before the Year of the Dragon. The Year of the Dragon is said to be a year in which there will be great power and strength and good fortune. There are 12 animals in Chinese astrology and the dragon is the only animal that is mythical and it is associated with the emperor in ancient times in China. So are all of your containers with the lids off? Okay, so let me just. So what we're gonna do now is marinate the chicken. With stir fries, you always want to marinate chicken, pork, beef. You never need to marinate shrimp or scallops or fish. The marinade needs to be very quick. You, in, in Western cooking, we marinate something overnight, or at least four or five hours. But if you did that with a Chinese stir fry, the dish would actually be too salty. It would absorb the sodium from the soy sauce. And so you want a very, very quick stir fry, a quick marinade. So this is 12 ounces of chicken that have been cut into quarter inch thick pieces. This is another point that we need to make with a stir fry, and that is all the ingredients need to be cut as uniformly as possible. You don't want to have quarter inch thick pieces of chicken, half inch thick pieces of chicken, because by the time the quarter inch is cooked through, or the half inch is cooked through, the quarter inch is going to be overcooked. So we have, um, in addition to the chicken that was cut, um, shiitake mushrooms, also cut quarter inch thick. We have um, Napa cabbage that was cut crosswise into quarter inch thick pieces. And with the shrimp that I just demonstrated to you, I arranged everything in the order that I was going to use the ingredients for the stir fry. Same thing here. We've lined up everything in the order so that you don't even have to think. Stir frying is on high heat, and so you have to concentrate all your energies on the stir fry as you're doing it. And so if you have to think for a second, what goes next? Is it the mushrooms or is it the noodles? That hesitation, something could start to burn in your walk. So we're going to start with the chicken, and we're going to add the ginger. There's one teaspoon of rice wine or dry sherry, one teaspoon of soy sauce, a teaspoon of cornstarch, a quarter teaspoon of salt, and a quarter of a teaspoon of white pepper. So just stir that mixture until the cornstarch is no longer visible. You don't want to see any white powder. And then here we have a tablespoon of chili garlic sauce and you're going to add a tablespoon of the dry of the rice wine or dry sherry and a tablespoon of the soy sauce. And just to stir that. And then again, we have only two tablespoons of oil used for this recipe. Um, 
So this recipe serves four. That, may, that means it's only one and a half teaspoons of oil per person. So when you think about that, it's extremely healthy. Most stir fries are vegetable focused with a minimum of protein. In Western cooking, so often you have eight ounces of chicken, 12 ounces of chicken per person. Here, in contrast, it's 12 ounces of chicken. As I said, my work has been primarily about teaching stir-frying for the home cook. And I always advocate using a carbon steel wok that is flat bottom. The ones that we have today are round bottom, but these burners are fairly powerful, so we're able to do it. But for the home stove, I recommend a flat bottom wok because the round bottom wok is going to wobble on your stove. So generally, you must use a wok ring, and the moment you use a wok ring, you use a wok ring, the wok is set a little bit higher and too far from the heat to get adequately hot. So by using flat bottom, it sits closer to the stove. When you buy a wok, it's really a horrifying time. So many of the cookware stores are only selling nonstick. Or you can buy stainless steel, anodized aluminum. I am a great um, advocate of using carbon steel. It is the traditional material, and the more you use a carbon steel wok, it becomes naturally nonstick. It is like cooking with cast iron. So I call it ancient nonstick cookware. So it's so important right now. When you go to Chinatown, so many of the stores are selling nonstick woks. And so for me, this is one of the great traditions in Chinese cooking that I am trying to preserve. So we're going to heat up our woks now, the highest heat possible. And as I said, we're going to use the water drop test to test how hot the wok is. So many people think, Get the wok as hot as possible, the hotter the better. But your, the hotter the better, the hotter the, um, the wok is not necessarily the best because you can lose control of the, the um, control of your stir fry. And it can burn and kind of run out of control. So just use this water drop test. Your wok is already starting to smoke. Yeah. So we're flicking a drop of water in. Make sure that all the water has evaporated because that's why we had that little bit of spattering. So now we're going to swirl in the tablespoon of oil and then add all of, oh, I'm sorry, we're adding the red pepper flakes first. And we need our spatulas. And then adding all of the chicken. So you want to spread out the chicken and just let it sit for about a minute to start to sear. That looks great. And then you can start to stir fry. And as you can see, these are well seasoned woks. There's absolutely no sticking. And you just want to stir fry it until the chicken pieces are no longer raw looking. Then you add all the shiitake mushrooms. It's two cups and three cups of the cabbage. And stir fry it for just about a minute. So the mixture is sort of three quarters cooked right now. 
And now we're just going to put it back into the pan. So normally I'm not prepping the ingredients in high stainless steel containers like that. I prep it into a kind of shallow bowl so it's easier to transfer the mixture back in. There. But as you can see, there's almost no sticking. So now we add the last tablespoon of oil, the noodles, make sure the oil is spread in the wok, <clears throat> and then we add the noodles. And the noodles have been cooked already. It was about like one or two minutes, fresh noodles. Rinsed in cold water, and then tossed in sesame oil. And you toss it in the sesame oil so that the noodles don't stick. So because the noodles are already cooked, what we're really doing here is just reheating the noodles. So we're swirling in the soy sauce mixture with the chili garlic sauce, the scallions, and the last three quarters of a teaspoon of salt. And finally, the chicken mixture with the vegetables. So this is a fabulous one pot stir fry meal. And in this day when so many people are dealing with the high cost of food, these ingredients are very inexpensive. This is a great meal for a family with high in vegetables, minimal meat, <clears throat> and it's also energy efficient. We're thinking about how much energy we're using when we're cooking, when you're roasting a chicken versus making a stir fry. And that's it. Looking good. Okay. I guess you can bring yours right over. Yeah. Thank you. Can you? Right. So I just want to explain to you that in ancient China, the the round bottom wok was always, has always been the traditional wok that was used. And it was always used on a hearth stove, which is a, sometimes it was a clay stove that had a hole inside. And then there was a door and you could put in your twigs, dry grass. And when you see somebody use this in China, it is so fascinating because the cook is so in tune with every dish that they know for stir frying vegetables, they only need like five twigs or for stir frying the chicken with lo mein that they're gonna put in four little pieces of wood and that's all they need. And the height of the hearth stove is like right about here with the hole so that you don't need to hold the handle. It's stuck in the hole and so you can just stir fry like this or add your ingredients while your other hand is using the spatula. And so I don't know if you noticed but this surface is a little high and now the burner has another like four inches on me. So I'm doing this kind of action which is not quite natural. Natural. But in ancient times, that is how the wok was intended to be used. And when they finish stir frying, if you open up the little door and look in, there's not even a quarter of an inch of the twig left because that's how conscious people are about using minimal fuel when you're stir frying. 
So what did you think of the taste of the shrimp? Did you like that? So it's a great concentrated flavor. And as I said, when you go to a Chinese restaurant for the same dish, it's normally oil blanched and then stir fried. So the home version is infinitely healthier for you. And now with this chicken lo mein, you know, I'm giving you the basic ingredients. There's a tablespoon of the chili garlic sauce. But if you like it spicier, you could add an additional tablespoon or two. Or if it's too spicy, you can reduce it to one teaspoon or eliminate it completely. So as you're eating that sample, I just thought I would touch up, I would touch on the subject of what I will be speaking about on Thursday at the public program, which is at the Mission Memorial Auditorium. Um, it's being sponsored by the Hawaii Culinary Education Foundation, also Les Dames d'Escoffier's um, chapter here in Honolulu, the Chinese Chamber of Commerce, and the Mayor's Office of Cultural Affairs. And um, I'm speaking about the importance of preserving and protecting Chinatowns. I was just in your Chinatown this morning for the first time. Um, I am, as Haley mentioned to you, known for my cookbooks. And at the start of the pandemic, I saw New York City's Chinatown empty out and become a ghost town. But it didn't happen just to New York City's Chinatown. It happened to Chinatowns all across the United States. And that is because of President Trump's irresponsible rhetoric of calling it China virus and um, Kung flu. So people were under the impression that if they went to Chinatown, they could catch COVID, even though we're, there were no incidents of COVID at all in Chinatown. And so, in January and February of 2020, many of the businesses in New York City's Chinatown and Chinatowns across the country lost up to 80% of their normal business. And Chinatowns across America now continue to suffer. And it's so important for all of us to support uh, America's Chinatowns. These are immigrant enclaves that represent the American story. And in this time at, uh, of our lives in America right now, all of us are so accustomed to shopping at big box stores and chains. And during COVID, we got so accustomed to scrolling and clicking because it was the safest thing to do rather than to go to a store. But Chinatowns are made up of mom and pop businesses, which used to be the backbone of this country. And so um, Honolulu's Chinatown is historic. It dates from the 1870s. I was totally charmed by all of these wonderful markets and shops and restaurants. And so I encourage all of you to go to Chinatown and explore it but it's the prices in Chinatown are the most reasonable. All of us are watching our dollars right now. So when you're shopping for your food, this is a great way to save money and also sometimes to buy the freshest ingredients. So um, I hope that if any of you are around on Thursday, I invite you to attend this um, public program that I'll be doing with Chef Robin Maie of FET Hawaii. And um, I encourage all of you to spread the word that it's up to us to support America's Chinatowns. And without our support, we are at risk of losing these very, very important immigrant enclaves which represent the American story. So I think we have like five minutes left, and I am happy to answer any questions that you have about stir frying, Chinatown, um, what it's like in New York City right now. I'm sure none of you could imagine 18 degree days. <laughs> When I stepped off the airplane the other day, we were wearing down coats and we got our beautiful lays from Haley. And I think you've never seen a lay with a down coat before. So, any questions at all? Yes. I'm sorry. So the question was for the garlic, do you slice it or do you mince it? Um, it's minced. 
And so that is for the um, salt, and pe the pepper and salt shrimp. So the ginger and garlic were minced. Yeah. But you could also, if you wanted to, you could take the cloves of garlic and smash them, but it infuses more flavor to the shrimp if you mince it. Yeah, any other questions? Nothing about the technique of stir frying? Okay, well, thank you so much. Oh, yes. So the question was, if I was to go to Chinatown, what kind of street food should I try there? In Chinatown, street food? Um, so when I was in Chinatown today, I saw it wasn't on the sidewalks being sold. You had to sort of walk inside a little bit, but it was sort of partially street food. Uh, you could buy roast duck. You could buy Chinese barbecued pork that looked fabulous. Um, of course, there are these uh, wonderful bakeries like um, Sing Chong Yuan Bakery that's famous for their Malapua, Malapua. Malapua um, baked buns and Royal Kitchen that's also famous for something like that. Um, I saw the fantastic um, Chinese rice rolls, which in Cantonese we call chong fan. They used a different name for it, but I can't remember the name of the store, but it looked like it was out of ancient Asia. You know, in the background, I could see all the workers, and one of them looked like they were, the, this woman was like 90 years old. I mean, it's just, I wanna say to you that in New York's Chinatown, when these businesses, when I say they lost 80% of their business, everybody still showed up seven days a week, working 10, 12, 14 hours with no one coming in. I watched it for weeks and for months. And if you ask most of these businesses, they all represent the American dream. All of these are immigrant businesses where people came to this country with nothing and they worked for years to save up their money to open up their little business. There is a little Vietnamese restaurant in Chinatown in New York City that has been around for 30 years. He came to this country with nothing, um, Dennis, Dennis Chung, and he worked as do cleaning houses for one or two years, and then he worked as a delivery man for 12 years to save up his money so he could open this restaurant. And I saw him with nobody coming into the restaurant day after day after day. Um, and not only that, when, when business started to pick up a little, so many of these businesses in New York City, San Francisco, Oakland, we were dealing with anti-Asian hate crimes where people were coming in and yelling profanity to the owners, to the workers, where workers were scared to come in. So um, it's... Yeah, when, when I say that it's so important to support these businesses, I'm saying it to you from my heart that you have to get word out there that it's so important that we support these mom and pop businesses. And when you see a 90 year old woman in this little rice, it's called, a, it's like a, a rice crepe that is filled either with barbecued pork, sometimes it's scallions and cilantro. Um, you want to support them. When you see all the work that goes into it, there's a vegetable market in New York City's Chinatown, and it's run by this husband and wife. Three or four o'clock in the afternoon, the daughters show up from school, and they go into this little back room, and they're doing their homework, and they're eating a snack, and by four or five o'clock in the afternoon, they come out, and they start working the cash register, and they're trimming vegetables, and they stay till nine o'clock when, when they go home with their parents. When you see that, you think to yourself, I'm not going to Trader Joe's to buy my vegetables, right? Or people are buying their, yeah, they're ordering online, fresh direct. You want them to succeed when you realize the grit and the determination and the sacrifice they are giving to these businesses. So 
I found a way to promote Chinatown by your simple question of what kind of street food, but it's really something that's so dear to my heart right now that without our help, these businesses are historic and they will not survive. Um, the other question that we got was, uh, which is your favorite dim sum place in Hawaii? Oh, well, I, if that's an easy question because I only got to go to one today and it was incredible. It was May Sum and that means beautiful heart and the food was really fantastic. I was very, very impressed. And um, it made me really happy to see the dining room really full because um, I know this was not the case another, like a year or two before during COVID. I know Honolulu's Chinatown was really suffering. But the one that we were trying to go to was Fuklum, I believe. Yes. So um, I would suspect that one's fantastic too. You have a wonderful, wonderful Chinatown, and you should really take advantage of it and don't take it for granted. Washington, D.C. used to have a huge Chinatown. It's down to a half a block right now. Philadelphia's Chinatown is fighting for its life. The 76ers are trying to build a billion dollar stadium and just push Chinatown out. Seattle's Chinatown is fighting for its life. Boston's Chinatown is fighting for its life. It's adjacent to the financial district and the workers haven't returned and so there's no lunchtime business and older uh, Asian Americans are afraid to come out at night because of anti-Asian hate crimes. San Francisco Oakland, exactly the same. New York's Chinatown is doing better right now, but it has not returned to the foot traffic and tourism that we had before the pandemic. So protect our Chinatowns. Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much to Grace. I hope you realize how significant it was to experience this today and to have Grace here all the way from New York City to come to your program for this special program for all of you. And I hope it will inspire you to make a, a difference by how you shop, how you go out into the community, how you support local businesses. Because because perhaps someday one, you will all be a restaurant owner or working in a restaurant, and it could be in a community where you need that community support as well. Powerful program, Grace, and we're so grateful that you were with us. I want to recognize Chef Robin, my EE. -E. <laughs> James Beard Award winner, I think you all know. Her restaurant's located in Chinatown. Fett Restaurant, and she's going to be presenting with Grace on Thursday at the Mission Memorial Auditorium. And we're very honored to have you come out, and we know from your very busy restaurant, to spend the day with us. And I understand you're going to be uh, doing a program with the students later on coming up their fundraiser. So thank you, Chef Robin. And I want to thank all of you for allowing us to be here for the Hawaii Culinary Education Foundation. We're grateful to La Dames d'Escoffier Hawaii who supported this program and to all these folks back here that don't get enough recognition, the folks that help from the special events class and appreciate all the prep work they did for all of you and your chef instructors who did a lot of extra work on, the, on getting ingredients and setting up. So thank you very much for that. And we hope that you are thinking about your future and giving back to the Hawaii uh, community by how you represent it by your education here at Leeward Community College. Thank you very much.